Welcome back everybody to the Best Wines Online Tasting Room. I'm Kyle Meyer. And uh, next to me is a guy who like, you like uh, drove a really long way to get here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah like... dr drove and swam actually, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> In case you didn't get the accent, that accent is uh, Dinky Day Australian. James Lindner from Langmile Vineyards and Winery in the Barossa Valley is with us today. And uh, it is a real treat to have someone from the Barossa here today. You know, usually a lot of these cats don't make the road trip over here to come see us. So it really is a sincere pleasure and a treat that you're sitting next to me today. And that we get to glean, uh, we get to pull a little bit from your brain as to what's going on in the Barossa Valley with Australian wine right now. You know, the, um, uh, welcome. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Too easy. Very much. That's <laughs> just an airplane. No, and now, you know, and we did a tasting prior, and of course, the, the entire range of Lang Mile wines is actually really outstanding. They're they're one of these cats that that, um, as you said earlier, you, you make wines that you would like to drink. Yeah. You know, worst case scenario, you don't sell bottled, then boom. Okay, you got something in the cellar that you're gonna love. And the style to me is, I think a lot of people talk about, you know, the elegance and polish of Barossa, you know, the potential elegance and polish of Barossa Valley wines. But a lot of people, they do it through picking too early or taking shortcuts or doing things a different way. I think what we see here is we see thoroughly ripe, beautiful, genuine Barossa wines, but done in a more elegant style. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, yeah. I think for us, that's always been a, a driving uh, force. Um, like we've been very fortunate that um, growing up in the district as we have uh, like six generations to live the family. We were good uh, metwish makers before we made wine actually, <laughs> so from the 1800s. Uh, but really, um, you know, we have a very um, open uh, region and uh, so, you know, the winemakers that have gone before us, you know, are more than happy to share their knowledge and, and you know, they share their wines and, and you know, these are the things that, um, that drive us and then I suppose we, we take that and then we put our interpretation of that. So we're sort of staying really true to the roots of, um, of the Barossa. Speaking of staying true to the roots, you know, the Barossa has an amazing old wine heritage. I think, you know, as, as far as source material for making profound wine, I don't know if there's a region that has a better library of stocks from a vine standpoint to work with in the Barossa Valley. So when I see this new um, charter series, yeah, this is pretty exciting. Talk about this. All right. So like as a, um, I suppose as a district um, and as a region, you know, we, we work together quite well. And and one of the things that uh, we find, uh, particularly in the in the Barossa, is the um, with these old vines, is actually sharing these stories and making them relevant, and then taking that message to the world and explaining the, you know, I suppose the. Um, the understanding that how unique it is to have vines that are of a significant age. You know, we're talking vines that are over a hundred years old. You know, right, right. Um, so um, one of the concerns that we did have is the potential to dilute this message of old vines, like mm. the word reserve. Like the word reserve is really diluted. Right, right. You know, so in the end, um, it sort of started really with uh, Robert Hill Smith and Brian mm -hmm, Walsh at mm -hmm. Yolumba, and and uh, then he went about. I think he was talking to people like Stephen Henchke and Robert O'Callaghan, and and uh, name a few. And then um, it was then brought to the the attention of the Barossa Grape and Wine Association, which represents you know a thousand grape growers and um, and uh, two hundred wineries, and um, to talk about old vines and and what is an old vine. So. Collectively, we agreed at a starting point that, that we could say hand on heart that we think an old vine starts at 35 years of age. Yep. Um, 35, the, the vine itself has really got its roots uh, down through the, the soil. Um, it's anchored in, the vine's mature, it's um, it creating a balance within the fruit and, um, and uh, I suppose a balance from season to season, which is very important. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so that's where we started, and interestingly enough, in some areas of the world, at 35, they start ripping them out, you know, and um, so... <laughs> Napa Valley. <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure. I, was, <laughs> I'm, I won't hold you to that. No, 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 no thank like, you. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, and that was a, that's an interesting thing for us. So we said, right, collectively, let's agree, right. and so we did, and so um, the Old Vine Charter represents four distinctive areas. So okay. 35 years to 69 years is Old Vine. 70 year old to 99 we classify as a survivor mm -hmm. vine 
uh, from 100 years old to 124 years is um, centenarian, mm -hmm. and then from 125 plus is ancestor vines. And and with the ancestor vines, you know they are vineyards that were planted by the first white settlement in in the Barossa. The fact that there's an ancestor vine category. Yeah. <laughs> Tells you a little something right there. I know. That's hilarious. Well, well, one That's of the, hilariously beautiful. Uh, well, the, the one thing that, you know, we're proud of and um, we are, you know, to be um, and privileged, uh, we are the custodians of a, a Shiraz vineyard called The Freedom, yep. uh, planted in 1843. You know, this vineyard is today 171 years old. Yep. Now, you know, we're, um, like I say, privileged to have that, but that is just part of the, the, the story of the Barossa as a whole and uh, the collection of old vines that are around the Barossa. So there's other producers, you know, that have, I think, Shields Muru is from 1847. Mm -hmm. um, I know Peter Lehman had 1885. You look at Command, you know, that's an old vine wine. You got Dean's Old Garden. Yeah, yeah the yeah. Mavedra yeah. from his, uh, you got the Cirillo Grenache, you yeah. know, the Penfold's Bin 60A Cabernet, you know, there's, so there's, our belief as a district is that we have the oldest surviving Shiraz, Grenache, Mourvedre, and Cabernet, Cabernet yeah. in the world. In in but we're New World. But but new, yeah, <laughs> try to convince me. Yeah. yeah. When you have the oldest of everything, are you really New World? Yeah. Are you really? I don't know about that. I don't know about that. <laughs> Our gags are old too. Yeah. Sorry. So let's talk about the Jacobins Cabernet. Um, even though it's got the thirty-five on the front, in fact, the vines are older than this. Tell us a little bit about this vineyard. All right, so this vineyard was planted in 1964. Um, Cabernet really, had the, I'm not sure of all the maths on it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but 1964, it's, um, um, I suppose, an era in the Barossa where we were going from really making fortified wines to dry red wines inspired by, you know, Bordeaux, yeah. uh, because that was what the English were drinking. Mm. Um, England had a, a fairly profound influence on some of the styles of wine that we were making. Uh, so it was really um, a whole mindset um, of change in the Barossa around the 50s and 60s to make dry reds. And mm. this particular vineyard is uh, comes from an old vine, um, um, I suppose, clone that we call, you know, in-house the winemaker's clone. We don't mm -hmm. put a number to it. But highly vigorous, low yielding, um, a vine a, um, I suppose a clone that hasn't really gone on too far because a lot of the farmers uh, couldn't make a living growing this clone. You know, they yep. needed to get certain yields. But for us, you know, when we first saw this and, and the first year that we actually made wine from it, it was just outstanding. And, <laughs> and so, um, you know, Cabernet is a premium variety. It ages in, in, you know, incredibly well. I think it's one of the reasons it's the largest planted variety, I believe, in the world, you know. Well, if you got a 50-year-old vine patch of Cabernet, you probably should make a pretty respectable wine from it, I'm guessing. Yeah, you would hope so. You would hope so. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the Beautiful. one of the interesting things about um, the old vine, um, they talk about you know um, old vines don't make good wine. It's because they make good wine. The vines are, are old. old. That makes sense. Yeah. You just made me feel really stupid right now. <laughs> I've never thought about that before until just this moment. Well, beautiful wine. Thank you. No, very but much. And, and I think it's the house style, right? You know, good. full of fruit, but savory, but tender and polished but elegant, slightly racy, but in a good way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I dig it. And I, I love the, um, my brother makes wines that I think, I took like straight lines, it's sort of like you can get the, fl going down the side of your tongue and, mm -hmm. and then that really nice sort of brightness yep. at the end and yeah. I agree, oh that's good. Mm. Okay, well the wine next to it is like, um, it's, it's got a hundred on the front, right? Yeah. So that means these vines are like really old. Yeah, well, the, the the average age is between 100 and 124 years of age. That's old. So that's old. That's but, old. Yeah, but if we keep drinking good wine, we could get there, Carl. I reckon there's opportunity. I'm shooting for triple digits. I want to be on the charter. Yeah, you could. <laughs> Actually, I think technically I'm already on the charter. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be able to send you your own shirt. Right. I'm a centenarian <laughs> and damn proud of it. So yeah, so this is, um, you but, know. But, but I think the interesting here is we were talking about earlier, is this is sourced from several different um, paddocks or patches yeah. that are more than 100 years old, which yeah. you, don't, you don't even get that opportunity in most, in most places of the world to do that, to source from multiple centenarian patches. Yeah, yeah. And uh, for us, it's a privilege. And, yeah. you know, obviously, 
if we can make wines like this from it, you know, this is where the rewards come from. You know, these wines are both going to age incredibly well. Um, you know, the structures because of the roots are, are really deep. Um, and you know, for example, like one of the vineyards from the valley floor where we get the sort of the power for this mm -hmm. wine from is actually a fence. It's this guy's fence. There's like 120 <laughs> vines and it's like, we will buy your fence. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, we're small enough that we can right. get 200 kilo of this fruit and know, yeah. you know, that we can make something incredible as part of the overall old vine wine. Unbelievable. Yeah. Okay, 60 seconds. Tell me why it's called the Orphan Bank. All right, so um, a few years ago, there was a patch of vines in, mm. the, in the middle of what was the original village of Langmile. Uh. Um, we'd been making great wine from this vineyard for many years, um, but one particular day, the grower decided he was going to rip them out to put housing in. And uh, he, was, he was going to get a big payday for yep. that. And so, you know, we were uh, obviously upset by that. Um, I, you know, knowing uh, the heritage and understanding how unique old vines are in the world of wine. Mm. Uh, so we ended up making a, a pact with this guy and together we worked. And we actually literally moved that vineyard a kilometre down the road to our own property. So we literally dug up this 140 year old vine one at a time. We took a massive root ball, like the biggest root ball we could, and then we moved that vineyard. And you know, five years, uh, well 2006 is when we did it. Yeah. Um, since then, I think we've got 90% success. Um, it's dry farming again, um, and is a small percentage of this wine, and uh, but very much a big part of the heart of what sort of drove to make this wine. Hence orphan, the little vines were orphaned and plant them on the banks of the river right near our place. Uh, I don't think anybody else like in the history of vine kind ever has ever done anything like that. And as you can see from the video uh, that we're flashing during this piece, um, it is really a remarkable, remarkable thing that you guys did. And it shows your passion and commitment to these wines and to the vines of the Brossa. Um, nothing but mad respect. Thanks. Oh my gosh, you yeah. guys, you guys do it for me. Cheers, thank you. This was fun. <laughs> Did you get all that? Yeah. All right. Cheers.